it's fine, it's fine. That's all right. That's all right. So um, I know everybody is not here yet, but I like to prioritize those who are on time. So why don't we go ahead and, and, and start? Lah. So um, I, I think, you know, when a lot of us are facing this whole COVID-19 situation, a lot of us are very fearful and a lot of us are starting to see things as very, very bleak. But I kind of wanted to also explore other things as well, because we need to remember that um, the last kind of fintech revolution was really sparked by the previous uh, global financial crisis, right? So we look at companies like Square, companies like Wenmo, who were kind of uh, started during that period of time. Uh, one could also argue that, you know, looking at COVID-19 is actually probably one of the biggest catalysts for digital adoption that we will see in our lifetime. So of course, um, we want to look at how fintech startups can navigate these new and challenging realities. Uh, number two, we also kind of want to look at how our industry can band together to, to look at what we can do for our fellow Malaysians and also SMEs as well. And lastly, uh, also on behalf of uh, the MDAC team, we wanted to gather feedback for the government to send suggestions for the upcoming stimulus package. So just bear in mind that uh, this session is intended to be casual. We're not going to wait until like the end of the session. It's like anyone questions. So treat it like a, you know, one of those TikTok streams, right? If you guys have any questions, just feel free to shoot in. Uh, we will try our best to answer, but because there's quite a number of participants here, we won't necessarily be able to answer all the questions. So having said that, let's uh, begin the session. Um, maybe we go one round by each panelist to talk about how generally the, the whole COVID-19 situation has actually impacted your business. Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Waiken since you're on top of the camera list. <laughs> oh, okay. Morning, everyone. Thanks, Vincent. And uh, thanks, Datu, for, for hosting this whole initiative. Um, uh, from, from our end, at such a way, everything operationally has been digital from day one, so it wasn't hard to actually connect the, the PCP and everyone had to work from home. All our critical systems in terms of receiving, withdrawing money um, has been automated and digital from day one, so it wasn't hard for us to transition. So, so aside from being operationally uh, smooth and business as usual, I think the, the main thing we focused on obviously is the communication with our customers because this external health crisis has affected the markets so quickly and so badly it even caused OPEC to fall out and cause a crash in the, the, the oil, oil market. So obviously markets are rolling right now for the is very high. Customers are understandably very nervous because some of them are losing yeah, their capital and all that. So for us, it's all about uh, communicating best practices we, we haven't switched track from, hey, you guys uh, used to do this, now now do this, right? We have a different product or we have a, we have, we have a different thing. We've always practiced uh, best practice from day one. So we are telling customers to reassess their, their relationship to risk, looking at their personal finance habits and all of that. So consistency of message is very key for us. Thank you, Ken. Um, so Dr. Wamping, I think uh, among all the panelists here, you probably manage the largest team. Uh, I'm, I'm sure um, that is also in some ways uh, impacted as well. So maybe you can give us a little bit of a rundown of uh, how COVID-19 has actually affected things at um, that at the moment. Thank you, Vincent. Good morning, everybody. Um, happy to be here to share some of the experience. We have actually been very prepared, I have to say, prior to even the MCO, uh, was uh, enforced, uh, MDEC has been uh, preparing to, to work from home because uh, we didn't know when government will, we, we, we kind of like thought this may happen. So we have started, we call it Team A, Team B uh, uh, practice uh, to, to, to ensure the safety of our, our wellness of our staff. And, and we have installed all these um, digital tools so that whenever it's required, we can uh, start using it. So, so this somewhat has helped us to manage uh, our work. Obviously, it's not going to be the same. So I cannot say that everybody can get used to this. Even though MDEC can do it, and in fact, we work 
even harder <laughs> during this time than, than, than other time. But uh, we have a lot of external uh, stakeholders, customers, clients that we have to deal with, and not everybody is ready for that. So if you talk about our own work, we actually have to do more, including um, well, to coordinate and facilitate uh, a lot of um, extra uh, inquiries from, from our our partners and customers. Take for example, there's essential is essential services, right? But nobody is clear on what that is about. And we had to work over time, over the weekend, at night, calling like anyone we can call and and, and come up with a solution that can help our our stakeholders, our investors to continue to do their business. And, and, and many other things that, that, that we have to, to put in place. But apart from that, from MDAC point of view, all people generally are very much um, uh, getting used to, to working uh, remotely and collaborate. And, um, and, and I'm very happy to, to also share that because we, we prepare ourselves and we give very clear, uh, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word instruction, but more about um, process in place so that staff will know how to deal with situation and then they know who they can call. We have been using WhatsApp a lot, but now we use all this uh, Zoom, theme, WebEx, and you can name it to, 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 work, to do our work. So all in all, our operation, we can manage. Uh, we just hope that in fact, now it teaches the lesson because we've been talking about digitalization, go digital for all this while, but more can be done, especially for the, a lot of the conventional and traditional business. Thank you, Dato. And um, coming, maybe you'd like to share a little bit more about how uh, this whole COVID-19 situation has uh, affected things at funding societies. Yeah. So, um, coming, are you, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, for hosting. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so let me just quickly do a quick introduction about Funding Societies. Um, so Funding Societies is a peer-to-peer -peer financing platform for SMEs. Um, so we are an online intermediary that connects um, creditworthy SMEs that uh, traditionally may be underserved or unserved by the traditional financial institutions with um, individual as well as institutional investors. So we are that online intermediary uh, between those two parties. Um, so I think, so we have a regional presence across Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Um, as it relates to the whole COVID-19 situation, um, so obviously from a regional perspective, Singapore was the first one to sort of catch the bug, right? Um, and since then, we have already started split operations uh, more than a month ago, uh, whereby similar to what Data One was saying, uh, split teams A and B, um, splitting uh, different uh, critical functions and leadership roles um, across two teams so that they don't sort of um, connect with one another physically, right? Um, and we started that uh, more than one month ago. And I think in Malaysia, we started it uh, two, three weeks ago, we were preparing for it. Um, and then recently we have also instituted um, going beyond the split teams, but also everyone to work from home um, since the whole MCO order was, was issued. Operationally, internally, it wasn't um, too much of a challenge for us because a lot of the things that we've been doing um, are done, I suppose, virtually, right? So a lot of communications, a lot of the sort of decision-making uh, meetings, all those are typically done um, online. Um, and there's no challenge in terms of all moving them onto an online platform, um, which is basically the nature of work. I think where the, the bigger challenge lies is, uh, like Data was mentioning, the external parties that we deal with. Um, on the investor side, um, it is a lot more straightforward because they have been sort of onboarded onto the platform. Um, the entire whole onboarding process and the customer management process is done online. Um, there are obviously one or two um, investors that prefer to come in person and speak to, to us, um, but 90, 95% of um, or even 99% of all the interactions that we have with investors are done online. Um, I think on the SME side, it's where it's a bit more challenging. Um, so the way that we look at it is basically you have a you have a, a, a large chunk of the Malaysian economy which is still very much in the traditional economy. 
So they still uh, buy and sell and transact uh, with the, either with their suppliers or their customers um, in an offline manner, right? Um, and they don't really adopt um, digital technologies in terms of payments or tracking their receipts and accounting and whatnot. So a lot of things that they do is basically requires um, sort of physical meetings and interactions. Um, and that is similar when it comes to financing. So when you start talking to them about um, like, what does, what, what does the business do? Uh, who do they buy from? Who do they sell to? Um, how do their sort of day-to-day um, -day business operations work? Um, it is something that they typically find more comfort in terms of speaking to someone um, or setting up a meeting uh, rather than sort of talking it through the phone, right? Um, so I think that is one of the sort of adaptation points that we had to work around. I think the other one is also in terms of when it comes to sort of um, doing things like site visits and um, part of our due diligence process, we also have to be a bit more creative in terms of how do we use things like video conferencing, uh, when it comes to sort of um, signing financing agreements, how do we have the witnessing um, of the signing of the agreements and things like that. Um, so it, it, the, the challenge typically comes more from a um, external party, whether they are familiar and ready to adopt um, these digital technologies. Um, so that's one very big segment of the Malaysian economy. I think what is up and coming, um, and hopefully the silver lining of this um, MCO is that it sort of spurs the, the digitalization of the, of the Malaysian economy. Um, but one thing that we've been working on is basically serving um, um, sort of online or the digital economy um, since quite a long time ago um, across the region as well, uh, whereby we provide financing or we work with sort of platforms, e-market, uh, e-commerce marketplaces, um, and providing financing to this sort of um, this digital economy that we have um, and naturally for, for for merchants or SMEs that operate digitally um, that's le there's less of a challenge um, when it comes to sort of onboarding them and doing the risk assessments and doing the disbursements and whatnot so we we, we, we do see two different um, I guess segments um, of users um, that is I suppose re more readily adaptive and less readily adaptive um, and that's where we, we find that sort of um, challenge uh, at, at Tanya Societies right now. All right, thank you, Kaming. So uh, maybe we can have you and talk to share a little bit about how this whole new COVID-19 and uh, RMO situation has impacted uh, business and operations within the journey next year. Sure. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, I think operationally, we we were we, we expected it to come in, right? So we were preparing for uh, lockdown. We were preparing for lockdown shutdown a couple of weeks before that. Um, it's not ideal, right? I think only about you know, eighty percent of our people can actually effectively work from home. Um, but you know, our assumption is that the actual MCO is uh, sensitive, right? So we we'll make the best of make the best of um, the situation. Um, actually, working from home, uh, uh, from what we've seen, it's not really been a problem. You know, there's um, people are still Pretty productive in some ways. I think Dr. mentioned where people are almost working harder uh, because they we're kind of we're, we're trying to get people into the rhythm of waking up early and working days and weekends and, and nights don't really seem to mean much anymore. So conference calls kind of leak over into the evening, they leak over into uh, the weekends. So people are, are working. Um, so productivity wise, when working from home is, uh, is not a huge issue. I think similar to uh, funding facilities and stashed away. Um, you know, majority of our business is is, uh, is digitized, right? So people working will not be on an issue. Um, but again, I think the point uh, we see the same issue that everyone else mentioned, which is um, the, the bigger challenge is, is not us; it's it's our stakeholders, right? So both consumers, uh, consumers, and you know, banks and insurance companies. Uh, and to me, that's that's the most worrying thing, right? Because uh, we, can, we can clearly see that uh, the consumer sentiment has changed rapidly um, as a result of the MCO. You know, people's priorities have, have shifted. Um, and we can see that in terms of um, you know, what financial products they're looking for uh, and what they you know what they think about these financial products. And at the same time, you, know, you look at banks. Um, there's a lot of processes of banks which are you know which are still very manual, right? I mean, that's that's uh, uh, our business is very focused on trying to solve that. Uh, we still have a lot of problems to solve. So um, you can see that the MCO is uh, is, is going to slow a lot of things down um, in the financial. You know, Operationally uh, in, our, in our value chain, uh, we just can't avoid that. Um, but I think that's all temporary. Uh, we get over that uh, uh, 
thing which which um, which we're trying to prepare for now is you know what does what does the world look like um, once the MCO is finished. Okay, thank you, Yenta. Uh, my sense is that to some extent, a lot of our panelists have already kind of expected or anticipated something like this to happen and have already prepared some steps to address some of these issues, which is good. So I hope that's the case for a lot of the other companies who are joining us in, in this webinar today as well. But if you have any specific questions, again, about how some of these panelists are managing their operations, feel free to also type it in the uh, Q&A segment. Um, I have a few questions, but it seems like we've got a number of questions that are coming in from the audience, so we will answer those first. Um, so we have one question here from Ku Cha Chia. I'm so sorry if I butchered the pronunciation. So the question is, consumer spending will likely slow down in the coming months. How will this impact fintech? Will one or more types of fintech flourish more so than the others? Uh, of course, this question is open to anyone to answer. So if any of the panelists would like to take this question, let's go ahead. I'll jump in here. So um, obviously, there's a certain amount of consumption that one, once it's lost, it's lost, right? It's, if, if in this time you don't go on a holiday, it's not like after this whole thing is over, you'll go on two holidays. You know, you're not going to go buy twice the bottles at Zoom, right? Consumption is done already. So um, I think what the government is also doing is um, is to also give people liquidity options if they're severely affected. So um, allowing them to dip into their EPF savings, uh, reducing it from 11% to 7%, um, to take care of the count to up to 500 a month. I think these are all things to help with the liquidity. But from a consumption standpoint, I think people need to be very real with themselves. If they're really in need of that money, of course, by all means, access your, your, your retirement funds. But retirement funds is something that should be kept sacred and, and for your own retirement, right? And um, withdrawing it for short-term needs is, is the last thing you should do. If anything, after this whole thing is ended, you know, keep your, your consumption to a steady level and try and save and ultimately use that money to, to get back on, on, on track if you, if you own a business. And if you have had savings in the past few months, even, even look to invest. I think uh, a lot of people say that, that the best time to invest is when blood is on the streets, even if it is your own blood, right? Very, very easy to say when markets are climbing and it's very smooth, right? Mm -hmm. But when you look at long-term graphs, you, you always look at the bottom of the chart and you say, oh, I wish I invested there, right? Whether you like it or not, we're seeing multi-year lows, right? So um, obviously we don't know if, if the, the, the market is at the bottom or, um, or, or whether we're out of this crisis yet, but how you deploy that cash that you've saved throughout this, uh, this whole period is also something that you should look at after this crisis. If I can jump in as well on this. So it's a question on consumption and as well as FinTech. So obviously during this time, people will still be spending on essential goods, perhaps on entertainment and uh, things. So, sorry, that the line is not very clear. But also just to frame the question again, the question is to look at uh, which fintech will flourish, which uh, fintech will be most impacted. Well, I, I think it's good that we're talking broadly, but also let's narrow down to specifically uh, how how it will impact certain types of fintech and which certain fintechs will, will, will have an advantageous position in, in this current market situation. Please go ahead, Dato. That's what I'm, okay. What I'm looking at is that people are still buying things. So we, we can use this opportunity to promote e-wallet because uh, we want them to, to reduce the use of cash. So uh, obviously the, the wallet players has to be creative in, um, in promoting and encouraging more people using that. Uh, that's one way. Secondly is, let's say if we are um, promoting e-commerce, especially during this, this time period. So those are uh, the fintech companies that can support uh, this kind of um, uh, pattern. So uh, online payment, and also, even though those things cash on delivery, use wallet. So I believe we, it's not always bad. It's like this is opportunity to, to educate people on the best use of uh, fintech as a solution to this. Another one I see uh, that is going to be useful is also also the new insure tech solution. 
Because now when you talk about delivery, compliance is key because you want to make sure that the safety, the, the hygiene factor is in. So, and, and we also want to make sure that the delivery people are protected. So I, I think FinTech company can look at rolling out solutions that can support this new way of doing business and not always thinking of, uh, this is my solution and my solution cannot be used. It's a time for us to look at how can I treat my solutions to support this new lifestyle. That's, that's what I, I, I think uh, FinTech society can think about. Thank you, Dato. Um, Kamin, do you guys have anything to, to add to the question? Um, I suppose uh, the way we are looking at it from our business is you know, what rather, I think our core business has been very much, we look at ourselves as a kind of a bit, right? So if you look, a lot of people think of businesses as, you know, are you a bit or a bit killer? Um, and, you know, up until now, when it, when it comes to how we work with banks and insurance companies, we, you know, we help them grow, right? we help them acquire customers through digital channels. Um, so that I would say that's very much a bit good, right? How do we help you grow your business? Um, but my you know, my assumption is going forward, and this is not just for banks, but pretty much for every business out there, um, you know, growing is not necessarily going to be the priority, right? It's going to be very much around, you know, how do I how do I drive efficiency in my business? Um, so that's something which we are which we've been working on for basically since um, since we've seen seen uh, COVID really really bite. Is you know how how can we help our clients and how can we help our consumers save money, right? Not so much about making money anymore. You know, how do we help them drive automation? How do we help them drive efficiencies? And I think in, in, in some ways, if you look at the current situation, one might argue that uh, aggregation sites like Ringgit Plus might see a bit more traffic once the MCO is lifted because a lot of people would actually try to be more conscious in terms of looking for good loan comparisons and, and whatnot, right? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I, it's so hard to predict more than like a week or two out right now, right? Yeah. But I hope and, that's true. and just from like very anecdotal um, observations, you know, Yes, I have a lot of uh, friends who are from the non-fintech kind of circle. So, uh, in in this entire week, they've been asking me, "Hey, uh, bro, how do I sign up for like stash away? How do I sign up for this robo advisor?" I, I think the amount of free time that they've had on their hands, some of them are actually trying to take action to to, to start um, investing in this platform. So now, I'm not sure if numbers have actually gone up or gone down in terms of signups, but yeah, there are some shifting behaviors. Um, some of my colleagues who are reporting in the Philippines are also telling me that for the banks, they're actually seeing a several, hun several hundreds of percent uh, increase in terms of the, the sign up for the digital banking platform. So I think there's some truth in terms of uh, how this COVID-19 is shifting uh, consumer behaviors to, to, to a more digital one. So um, we have another question over here, uh, which is directed directly at Kaming. So Kaming, you can take this one. Um, given the risk of P2P, which goes up multifold now, what protections are there for investors? Also, can moratoriums be given so that they don't throw in the towel and walk away, uh, right, raising the defaults? And I guess an additional thing that I want to add to the question is also to look at how funding societies may be relooking at the credit assessment in light of this new situation. Uh, Kami, please, you have the floor. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's a very valid question and something that we have been preparing. And so um, just to just to just to share, um, as part of our sort of value proposition and responsibilities, we are responsible for doing the due diligence and the risk assessment for SMEs that come to the platform to seek for financing. Um, and it's only when uh, they sort of meet the criteria or pass the due diligence and risk assessment um, uh, processes that we have, then we make them available on the platform. Um, so not all SMEs that come to us well, will be made available on the platform. For us as a platform, we do a regular review of the way that we underwrite. Um, so this means the sort of score parts um, internally that we have, um, the due diligence processes and whatnot. Uh, and we do it on an ongoing basis. Um, given so the, the whole virus COVID situation has definitely escalated the risk um, from, a, sort of, from a credit perspective, but it is not something that is only recently that's happening. 
Um, I, I suppose this has been a trend that we've seen since the second half of last year, um, given the uncertainties. I think the first half of last year was uh, very strong um, in terms of performance, but I think generally across the market, the second half, uh, there were, by, we do see an increasing trend in terms of um, delinquencies and defaults um, as, as, the, as a, the state of the world grew up a lot more uncertain in the second half. And so since then, we have already been tightening up and also looking at um, improving or um, setting higher criteria for the reassessment piece. And I think um, given now the situation with the, the whole MCO, uh, definitely you'll be impacting a lot of um, businesses out there. Um, and as a result, we also are reviewing basically the kind of risk assessment and what and not. I think um, having said that, um, there's always a silver lining, right? So there are always going to be defensive industries. Uh, there are always going to be counter cyclical industries, right? So say, for example, the e-commerce um, or the merchants or SMEs that sell predominantly online, um, those SMEs would actually be doing very well in this in this in this uh, in this season, um, and I think even those who are in the healthcare or related industries will actually be doing well. And basically, as the business volumes goes up and business activity goes up, um, then there will be a need for financing, right? So there will still be that silver lining. There will still be defensive and counter cyclical industries um, that are pretty worthy um, to be getting financing and whatnot, um, either through banks or through B two B financing platforms. I think for us um, internally, we have sort of uh, a couple of things that we have done. First is basically we have looked at the different industries and assess how each of these industries will be impacted um, by the virus situation. And um, it goes beyond just being a virus uh, situation to something that is more uh, wide ranging uh, from an impact of the overall economy, whereby uh, supply chains get disrupted, business activity slows down. Um, things like that. So we look at every industry and we see how each of those industries are being impacted. Um, and I was saying earlier, some industries would actually benefit uh, from the current situation. Um, so that factors directly into how we assess and the kind of financing that we approve uh, to be put under the platform. Um, I think the other thing that we have also been looking at it is from the, the, the need of financing and the, the use of the proceeds for financing. Um, so we have multiple products that we have on the platform. So for example, we have things like term finance, which is general booking capital uh, for SMEs. We also have things like uh, purchase order financing and we have uh, accounts receivables financing. Um, naturally now the, the, the focus is then to move more towards accounts receivables financing, whereby the transaction or the, the piece of work or services has already been um, delivered, right? And it is just a matter of bridging the payments from when the invoice debtors were supposed to make the payments on time um, within the credit period. So that is something that we see as um, being more resilient towards the whole uh, riskiness of the situation compared to, say, a general working capital for term financing, uh, as well as for sort of uh, accounts payables or purchase order financing um, that is, has more of a performance risk component to it. Right? So that's some, one other thing that we've done. Um, the third thing that we've done is basically having a look at um, some of our existing um, SMEs or issuers and see whether or not um, the financing uh, need and the repayment capability justify uh, the, the level of quantum that we have um, approved so far. And when necessary, we will make the adjustment as needed. So those are the, some of the things that we have done on the SME side. I think on the, um, the hard part is basically um, compared to banks, um, we are a, a platform that helps to manage the, the needs of both parties. Right. Um, so on one hand, whilst we try to do the best that we can um, to protect investors um, by doing the, some of the things that we have mentioned, we still need to be able to sort of provide the support that SMEs need during this time of need. Right. And that's where the hard part of balancing the two would be. Um, I think there's a very specific question around moratoriums. I think that is a, a tricky situation whereby the, the, the funds that are being sort of provided to these SMEs actually from individual investors. Uh, and many of them will be retail, um, mom and pop investors, um, working professionals and whatnot. So we have to be extremely careful when it comes to things like this. Uh, what we have done is basically being able to sort of look at it from a case by case plus, uh, basis. Uh, SMEs that come to us and say they might need to delay some of the principal repayments and whatnot. And we do look at it um, on a specific individual basis. 
Uh, and where possible, we do sort of have arrangements whereby we can delay some of the re uh, principal repayments to a later date um, when the economy recovers and so on and so forth. Um, but I think going the moratorium step is probably something that is um, a bit more uh, challenging for us, um, given that the interest payments and the principal repayments are actually due to the investors um, by the platform rather than us as a platform itself, right? So the, the, definitely it's a challenging time whereby we need to, we need to support SMEs on one hand, um, and not sort of um, sort of uh, turn off the taps as you may, or close your umbrella when they actually need it the most. Um, but at the same time, also we are hold accountable to investors and protecting their sort of um, um, their savings, right, and their investments. Um, so that's a trying time for us right now, um, and trying to strike the right balance. I think for us, it's basically maintaining the dynamism and always keeping up to date in terms of the latest developments, uh, rather than a, a, once, uh, a one approach or a sort of set and forget approach. Yeah, I'm, I'm sensing from what you're saying is that your circumstances are quite different from a bank and you have different people that and different stakeholders you're accountable to, therefore the car balancing uh, act needs to be in place. Um, I guess a quick follow-up question to that is that you know, in, 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 in light of uh, a lot of these SMEs facing cash flow problems at the moment, are you seeing more people trying to raise notes on the Funding Society's platform or is more or less the same before the, the whole COVID-19 situation? I think more or less the same. Um, the reason, so obviously there will be a lot more SMEs out there that are, would be more desperate for funding. Uh, mm. But at the same time also you have creditworthy SMEs mm. um, that previously needs funding but no longer needs the funding because they just want to watch and see, right? So. Um, there's that two sort of segment of SMEs out there, right? So mm. obviously then, um, if I may, so it's a bit too early to tell, but if I may, if I may say it probably cancels off each other. Uh, it could change in the next couple of months, uh, depending on how the MCO situation and the virus situation plays out. Uh, but I think there's always the SMEs out there that, there's always a risk when you sort of take on a new customer order. There's always a risk when you start, try to expand your business. And if you are an SME that is, managing your finances well um, and you are very much in terms of uh, mindful of the situation right now, you'll probably be also be very mindful of actually taking on financing um, because you do not know how the economy or how the world looks like will look like in the next six to twelve months. So it kind of cancels each other out. Um, all right, so we, we have another question here for Dato Wan Ping. Actually, there are several questions for Dato, so we'll just try combine it into one question. So um, the gist of the questions that are directed to Dr. Wan Ping is actually to look at uh, what MDEC is doing in, in, in this current situation, especially since COVID-19 is uh, hastening the move of traditional business into digital space. Um, and also to look at uh, whether MDEC can look at reactivating something like the CIP 150 for startups uh, in the next six months. So that though you, you, you have the floor. Oh, thank you for the questions. The digital economy part, I think I think it's important for us to 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 realize that at this moment, um they are, they are digital digital ready and re, re, digitally legged companies. So the, 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 the concern that we have today is those people who have no, uh, not prepared and have no access. So th uh, that's why from, because we've been talking to many uh, government stakeholders from the uh, MOF to Ben Nagara to, to EPU to our own ministry on what we can do to, to support these people. So important thing for us now is look at income because people are impacted, people are being laid off for so jobs. Thirdly is um, the business continuity, because a lot of people are not able to, to go on as business as usual. And some of them, their income are cut off. And many of these micro SMEs, their, their issue is that they may have just a few days of um, savings if they do not do it, not just that they are their employee will be without job. They themselves also will be in trouble. And the supply chain is another issue. So we have been talking about this under the new uh, going to be announced stimulus package. We are going to put in some of the suggestion to, to help out. So it's not so much of uh, 
your business, the digital economy uh, activities as usual. This is more like intensifying the effort to reach out to the community that in the past we said we can wait until they are ready. Now there's no choice. So it's like, how can we quickly onboard everybody to the digital world so that they can continue their business? So this is very much on the on the business side. We also need to look at the um, individuals who will be laid off. You know that, I don't know whether the report is true. As of like two days ago, they talked about 30,000 of Malaysian uh, may potentially be laid off the more to come. So this is a big uh, social issue. So the, the, the focus now is how we can help people to continue to earn income, maybe not the, the traditional way, but the, the other way using digital platform. This is one thing good is that we have been preparing this for, for years. So we do have a platform that we can do. Important is how to get this out to the, the, the workers out there, to the un unemployed people out there, to the people at risk out there, to quickly sign up and get trained and then to learn how to do things, how to earn income differently. And the other uh, segment that we are very, very concerned with is the micro SMEs. Not those who are already online, but those who are not online and have no means to go online because they don't even know how to. So how we can mobilize the community, the society, this is something that maybe people in this chat group can help as well. Because if you know of such a group of uh, people that we can go out and help, many of them in services sector, so get the word out there to, to, to encourage them to, to reach out so that we can help them. If they have something to sell, that's good. If they say they have issue with supply chain, we can easily link them up with the potential, either the, the, the we always say the end-to-end, -end, uh, connecting the dots. So if let's say I am a hawker that used to sell things, now I can't sell, right? So because I can't even have supply, so how can we link the supply to, uh, with them through the digital means? And how do I reach out to the customer? I do not know how to operate a e-commerce site. So get aggregator can help them with that. And this also gives uh, opportunity to delivery because today grab drivers will have no business because who is going to go out? Nobody is going out, right? How can you turn them into delivery? Again, this is something, but when, once you do that, then, then that's why I say that the insurance will come in. How can insure that can quickly? We know that like people like Policy Street may be doing something to, to, to offer this kind of... Uh, insurance to these people and and the other people who can give services like helping them to comply to the MOH requirement or MOHR requirement and also those people who are used to training people or helping them to digitize dig, digitize some of the product all these things can then come in so you can see a new type of uh, jobs have to go come in so here when we talk about digital driving the shaker we are looking at very basic fundamental reaching out and give people the the, the, the help. The question on the CIB 150 actually is actually more, CIB is actually from Cradle, Cradle not from MDAC. But anyway, we are also looking at uh, startups uh, concerned about, especially the funding issue. So something uh, immediately what people can tap is, uh, for SMEs of course, is the, the remember we, we announced this uh, Bank Sibana Nationals, uh, the, the, the matching grant. So this one we are looking at how we can uh, perhaps work with BSM to, if, to promote that a little bit more. But in terms of giving grant access to, to let's say, tech startups, uh, we don't have an answer today, but it's work in progress. We are looking at ways. So you have any suggestion, how we can benefit more people? We'd like to hear your view as well. Thank you. So I mean, um, to, to just add to that, I think the MDAC team will actually be compiling a, a list of feedback later. So um, later they will share a link. So if you guys have any feedback about what you think can be done, you can actually submit it and then the MDAC team will review as well. Um, that was just a quick one because you mentioned about the whole BSM program. I'm not sure if everyone participating is aware of it. So maybe you can just uh, elaborate very quickly about what that is about to, to make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, sorry, Dato, uh, you're still muted. I agree. So, so, so. All right, so the, this, is, this is something that we launched uh, on uh, 17th of April, uh, sorry, 17th of February, together with MOF. 
is a 500 million uh, grant uh, offered by government to help to digitalize uh, SME's business. So how it works is that we have a list of uh, technology service providers who is offering services in the five areas. If you go to our website, you can check on that one. So if you are someone who is providing services, you can actually sign up and we still continue the process that that's for supply side. From the demand side, they can apply to either BSN or SME Bank for them to, to um, tap into this fund. So this is supposed to be very straightforward and simple mechanism. So if you have a, a need to subscribe to some services, mm -hmm. technology services, is uh, up to 5,000 per company at, uh, for lifetime. So this is obviously for this to, to help the SME to go digital. So if, especially now, if let's say you have a need, so I, I would encourage you to go, go in and apply for that. Yeah, so give to up to a hundred thousand uh, SME. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for elaborating on that. I think one of the panelists wanted to add something earlier. Uh, please go ahead. Oh yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to echo one of the points that Dato was mentioning. So in a in a scenario like this, um, it is not the the corporates or the the commercial and mid market. Um, companies that will be affected as much because they, they have financial reserve and buffer. Uh, it is really the micro and the small um, SMEs, the mom and pop, that will be the most severely impacted. Because if you look at, uh, when we do credit assessment, one of the things that we look at is basically their, their cash flow. And you'll see that they have very little cash flow in terms of reserves and they really live uh, month to month. Um, so in terms of cash buffer, they probably have a maximum of a couple of months. So if the whole MCO situation um, lasts more than a couple of months and or the, the virus situation lasts more than a couple of months or quarter quarters, um, in terms of even their business um, will be definitely impacted unless they are able to sort of change the way that, that they deliver or they do business. I think just wanted to echo that point. Um, it's very real when you try to, when, you, when you're on the ground and you're actually doing the ass assessment of these SMEs. Thank you. Uh, and then that segues uh, really nicely into my next question. So, of course, we, we try to uh, be positive about this scenario, but there's a very real possibility that the virus will, will extend uh, towards the end of the year. There were many reports on that. And of course, there are also talks from the Prime Minister saying that, you know, we may extend it for another few weeks uh, and to be decided at the end of this month or maybe even beyond that. So I think you know, we need to think about how to contend with these new realities of uh, limited cash flow and even uh, a lot of difficulty in raising funding. So um, I guess my question to the panelists, maybe we will start with uh, YT. Uh, so what are some of the steps that, you know, if situation does not improve, what are the steps that you think uh, fintech startups can take to actually uh, survive with their current burn rate? What, what are some of the things that they can do? Um, how can they still try to uh, attract uh, investors to raise funds? Uh, please go ahead, YT. Oh, what a lovely question. Thanks. Um, I, uh, it's one of the best pieces of advice, uh, one of the best articles I saw recently was from, I was just pulling it up. Um, it was from the founder of, um, Silky Girls. It's not just for fintechs, right? Uh, I think what, one of the things that's unique, or that's unique, one of the things about fintech or technology is our, our biggest cost base is, is typically people, right? Like we don't run huge factories, we don't have huge capex. Um, so you know, uh, when you look at if you want how do how do you reduce your your burn rate, the, the, the biggest lever the biggest lever you can pull is going to be HR, right? Um, and how do you do that? Uh, well, let's see what's his name. Uh, yeah, Tan Tiam Hock. He wrote an article on Sunday, you know, in, in the Star, and he asked. Um, he said, "Look, right, if, you, if if the government wants to save jobs, then uh, uh, exempt companies from EPF contributions, right? I mean, it's it's um, you can save almost ten percent of your of your payroll cost right there, um, and that's ten percent of staff, which either you don't, which you know you do not have to uh, lay off or cut back." Um, I mean, practically speaking, I think uh, you know, I've seen a lot of um, advisory pieces go around from uh, law firms, um, and the, you know the advice is fairly consistent, right? And, uh, talking to other startups, you know, we, we all 
are looking at the same things, which is um, if it, even if, if it is possible to maintain employment, um, you are going to have to uh, look at salary cuts. You're going to have to look at uh, cutting back working hours, uh, increasing annual leave or increasing unpaid leave. Um, I mean, there's just no way around it, right? Um, if business volumes drop, um, you have to drop the drop or you have to adjust down your cost base to match that. Um, in terms of fundraising, uh, good question, actually. I have uh, really no idea at the moment. Um, but as you pointed out, right, at the start of the call, um, you know, a lot of great companies are, are founded and built you know, during, uh, during bad times. Um, you know, in investors, you know, VC funds and, and investors still have the cash, right? They still have the money. Um, they still need to deploy it. Uh, they'll just be looking for the different things right now. They'll be looking for the companies that um, the companies that can solve problems in, in the current environment. Uh, but the investors are, you know, they're still there. Uh, terms will almost certainly tighten, right? And, but I think that that um, talking to other startups uh, that already started to happen you know, over the last kind of six, six, uh, six to twelve months, ever since um, ever since the, the whole rework issue and the poor performance of IPOs last year, uh, fundraising terms were already starting to tighten. So I would expect an evaluation in terms to tighten further. Thank you for that. So I think um, two things that you rightly pointed out. I think number one, founders need to really think about their burn rate and really consider the, the possibilities that in the next few months, you, you have to have a very honest and difficult conversation with your employees about possible pay cuts, possible cut of hours and, and, and uh, even some possible layoffs as well. So I, I think it's important that we have a very honest and frank conversation to, to manage these expectations and, and kind of band the team together to be able to, to, to push and, and, and try to bring in revenue to avoid that from happening in the first place. Um, and you also rightly pointed out that, you know, there are still investments happening. Um, I think the, the key question is whether the startups in question can actually pivot into something that really solves problems in, in this day and age. Zoom, for example, which we are all on right now, I think recently raised quite a substantial sum. So that's, that's just something to, to, to think about. Um, so again, you know, this, this question is open to the floor. Um, if anyone would like to take this question, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll jump in here and sure, add on to what YT has said. I, I think it's, it's, it's very hard to, to write the course um, and it's a lot easier to start um, well from day one. And, and what I mean by that is that, you know, you set up your business in a way where the business model can, be, can, be, can withstand stresses and can move through the, the, the cycle, right? So from day one, we've been operating under very thin margins because our, our management fees are super low. They're only 0.8% at the high end. Basically, it means all the ops and all the, 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 the expansion plans need to be um, under that 0.8%. Uh, so from day one, we've, we've been taking steps to make sure our unit economic, economics are solid in the sense uh, that everything is very lean we don't hire more people than we, than we need. And when we do make big purchases, like when it comes to advertising or when it comes to um, um, even rent or like paying someone, we, we ask ourselves those, those questions, you know, like, is this sustainable? So if you're caught out in a situation where, where you've had a lot of funding and obviously you, 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 you spend it like there's no tomorrow to, to land grab, then you're definitely not in a good position now. But if you start well from day one, what you can do in this situation now is actually look to gain market share because then your other competitors who haven't been so wise with their, with their funds will probably go through very tough times and cut back on their, their marketing, cut back on their hiring, cut back on their R&D. So after we emerge from all this, you know, the, the winners are the ones who survive, right? The, when the asteroid came, the... The ones that survived were the dinosaurs, right? They were the, the, the mice that, that became mammals, that became monkeys and humans. So it's about being prudent from, from, from day one. Now. And for, for those of you who are thinking that now is a good time to, to, to stop talking about your business, marketing, to stop um, uh, going out there and, 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 and giving a consistent message, then you'll find yourself in a really tough, position uh, six months from now 
people will be very, very short term. They, they see what's in front of their nose, right? And they say, like, oh, in this situation, the best thing to invest in is um, digital healthcare, mass manufacturer, glove manufacturer. Like, honestly, you're not the you're, you're not the first genius who's thought about all this. In a recent article, as it relates to investing, we 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 actually uh, the, the article talked about the fact that if you switch to safe havens now, after everything has gone down, basically you are or you've already missed the bandwagon. You think gold price over the last year hasn't gone up twenty percent? You think U.S. dollar hasn't rallied? You think bond prices um, um haven't haven't uh, the, the yields haven't gone up because of all this QE and uh, oversupply of bonds in the market. If you don't set your risk right from day one, you will have to pay tuition fees and then you will learn hopefully. And then um, you'll find that you are caught out of position and then investors will go through what's called being whipsawed. Like, you know, if you, in, in, in bad times and you switch out the risky stuff, you buy safe stuff, which is already expensive. And then the, the risky stuff rallies the next day because they're bouncing out from, from multi-year lows. Then you switch back and then it goes down again because it's volatile. Basically, you get caught up. So it's about being, try, to, try to find that sweet spot for you in terms of uh, taking that risk. And, and that applies to your business as well. I think that's some really good points. And I, I particularly like the uh, anecdote about the dinosaurs being hit by asteroids. So that's, that's an amusing one. Um, anyone else would like to I add to this know. one? I go like ahead, Datuk. Yeah, go ahead. So... Okay, there are two things I, I, I like to, to, to share here, uh, to, to share. Um, Vincent, you start by saying that this is a good time for digitalization. I think this is, is very true. Well, well you, in the future, digital is going to be key for a long time to go. So if, I'm just saying that if the company can afford it, this is a time to start thinking about investing in the people to train them because business slow down. So if the company can afford, you should invest in training the people in the right skill set, especially the digital side of it. So because this is going to take them a long way. We hope that you know, uh, in, in the next few months, things are coming back to a more manageable skill and, and this, this skill set can, can be put into good use. Secondly, we talk about business transformation forever, but nobody actually seriously thinking about it. So just to echo what uh, Wyken was just saying as well, we have to seriously think about our business and how we can transform it to the future business and not just sitting down and wait for something to happen and hopefully think get, things will get back to normal and I go back to the business as usual. Even without this COVID-19, things will not be business as usual for most people. And now, now that we are hard hit, I hope that this is a wake up call as well for all of us to start seriously look at our business and see how we can survive in the future and thrive in the future. So um, go, company has to invest in this and it, because it's their business. Nobody can come in and tell them what to do, but it's them, this is a time that all heads put together and look at how do I transform my business and also make full use of the, the digital tools that, that they can use, analytics, RPO, whatsoever, to move forward and not just sit down and just worry and do nothing. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dato. Um, anyone else would like to add to that conversation before we move on to the next question? Come. Is there something you wanted to add, or? So I think um, I, I suppose just to add to I think mm -hmm. what I was uh, foreshadowed pretty much earlier in the conversation is that probably now is not a very wise time to be pursuing for growth, uh, but rather to take a more defensive um, approach, uh, because the thing is that for startups, um, it, it is something that whereby you do not have a lot of um, I suppose capital reserves as most MNCs and would not but not have. So you want to make sure that uh, you 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 do not chance it on uh, um, the current scenario uh, versus taking a more defensive approach for, for the next couple of quarters until things play out. Um, because there's a lot of, uh, because the situation is that whereby if you do, so there's one situation whereby the startups can escape, which is uh, uh, when you run out of cash. 
Um, and that's where it is an uh, absorbing state. You can it's, it's, it's impossible to get out from that state, right? So I think from a from a company strategy perspective, it may make more sense to be a bit more defensive uh, until things play out. Um, so you you want to take bets um, like what Tato one thing and and yourself were alluding to. You want to take bets, but you do not want to take such a big bet that uh, if you went south, then um, you you find yourself in in, in trouble. Um, so I think that might be wise for the next couple of quarters until things play out. Um, I think the other thing to, to the point to add, basically, <clears throat> perhaps it'd be good for if, you, if you're if you a fintech startup and you have already raised um, some round of financing or funding, I think it's good to sort of uh, take this opportunity to communicate more frequently with your shareholders and your board of directors um, to keep them in the loop um, in terms of what's happening, um, how you're thinking about it, what's your plan, what's your response, um, so that um, they know and you are sort of top of mind um, for, for your characters and your model right? So I think that's more of a sort of managing your stakeholders perspective, um, especially during these uncertain times. Yeah. Thank you, Carmen. So um, we are almost out of time. So we'll take one or two more questions. Um, we have one specific question here for Waiken and uh, probably I also want to add on a little bit to the question as well. So the question yeah. goes, um, what impact has uh, COVID-19 had on your portfolio performance? And to also add on to that, and I think this is important for a lot of fintech startups, is that how do you communicate with your user base and, and, and kind of uh, create trust, right? Because I think a lot, of a lot of your users will have a few concerns. Number one, it's like there's a bloodbath in the market. There's going to be some panic selling. Uh, number two is that they, they're going to think, okay, you know, this is a startup. Will they be around? You know, what will happen to my money? So I, I think uh, it's a two parts question. One is what is happening to these portfolios, and number two is how how are you uh, communicating communicating trust with your users? Yeah. So thanks for that. And for those of you who are not familiar, uh, we are a digital investment management platform, and we offer twelve different portfolios of different risk levels. And each portfolio is made out of uh, ETFs to give you what is targeted to your risk profile. So for the most risky stuff, then you have different US sectors, uh, European equities, and then on the conservative end, you have um, a lot of um, bonds um, and also gold and safe, safe equities. And all, all, all everywhere uh, along the, the every, everywhere in between. So obviously being um, uh, an investment product which is invested in the markets, we have been affected uh, quite badly, um, but it's all about what risk you expose yourself to. So it's not just across the board, like things are bad, right? So on the conservative end, actually is positive 2%. Yeah, I talked about year-to-date performance, positive 2%. And then on the most aggressive end, rightly so, it is, it is um, down almost 20% on the, on, the, uh, on the risky side. So uh, the, the, the big secret about Investing on stocks, obviously, that is very personal, right? Because I can tell you the percentages of, of the year-to-date performance and all that, but but it really depends when you, as a personal um, investor, have actually gone in yourself. So, for example, in 2019, um, the, the the conservative portfolios did 14 percent, and the risky portfolios did 33 percent. So, high risk, high return. The traditional adage uh, remains true. And also the performance is really down to when you actually invest. So do you want to chase returns when times are high, where most people do, or do you want to do what the sophisticated uh, and, and savvy investors are doing now, which is investing when, when, when times are bad, you know? Sophisticated investors are drip feeding into markets to slowly um, add to their position so that in a few months and years time, they can look back and say, oh, I bought, dip. I bought some on the dip. No one's saying that in this time where things are so uncertain, you go all in, right? I know no one's saying that, but you know, it's time to actually drip feed and build your position, especially when, when, when things are down. Coming to the second part of your question, which is to uh, about confidence, right? So when we were starting out late, late uh, 2018, there was a lot of questions about our legitimacy, you know, because we were the first digital investment manager, robo-advisor. So we went to great lengths to talk about the fact that we were SC licensed, talk about the fact that we have a trustee structure, two million put aside for regulatory capital, and, and we have uh, we get audited to death, basically. So I think we've beat that dead horse until people 
people don't actually ask the question whether we'll be around or not, but it's more about their own portfolios, what is happening, and can you provide some, some, some context. So these are the right questions to ask. So we have actually stepped up our, up, up our communication efforts. Normally, we do uh, weekly seminars in person, and we also do a market update on Friday. So because day by day things are in flux, you know, for example, over the weekend and when the oil prices crashed, and then uh, there was another Friday where the market was down 12%. It was the worst since the 1989, like, like Monday. We basically uh, went into overdrive and film a new video and put it out there and give people context. So what we are seeing now is actually a lot of government stimulus, right? Malaysia is the same. Singapore is the same. Uh, US also is, is uh, looking at different uh, measures to, to stimulate the economy. So the, the good thing is that, that, that all, all these governments around the world are coming up with their own solutions and, and it's no small sum. You know, in the US, we're talking about 1.3 trillion. So when these uh, policy, policy bazookas come in to really keep the, the economy afloat, that's when it basically puts a flaw to the markets and a flaw to the, 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 the downside risk of a recession. Obviously, we think the likelihood of recession is high. But with all this uh, economic stimulus in place, we think that it puts a flaw, a downside, um, to protect on the downside. So um, we, we've been communicating this, we've been telling people not to panic, providing context because it's a very confusing time, very, um, uh, a lot of people are very anxious. So we've been, we've been talking about what's been happening in the market and also reminding people about best practices, things like having uh, six to 12 months cash buffer for exactly for moments like today, not using leverage to invest, um, and then also choosing the right risk portfolio as opposed to trying to play pick up, pick up, or like whack a ball, right? Like during good times, oh, high risk. During, during bad, bad times, uh, oh, low risk. Then basically you get whipsawed around and you're, you're like schizophrenic, right? Like the market. So if you want to be schizophrenic and be a trader, you know, we, Stashway is not a platform for you. For us, it's just about long term investing. So just to wrap up, I know there was a lot. When it comes to performance, obviously, when, when times are bad, aggressive portfolios will be down. Uh, balanced portfolios will be, will, be, will be better positioned in terms of uh, downside risk. And then conservative portfolios are flat or up a bit. Um, but it really depends on when you personally make your investment. And then when it comes to communication, I think um, talking about the fact that you're licensed and you uh, have a very high bar when it comes to compliance and your operations helps in the early days. And then now, since it's very confusing, we've been, we've been communicating a lot in terms of both what's happening in the markets and best practices. Thank you for that. And I think um, one, one very important point is that for a lot of your investors, their loss is only realized if they actually do sell now. So that's also one, one thing to communicate as well, right? Um, so, okay, before we head into our last question, um, just two reminders to the audience that's joining today. Number one, the MNET team has uh, shared a feedback form. Uh, so this is our first time doing it and we may do it, as, do it more as we go along. So please share your feedback with us. Let us know how we can conduct this session a little bit better so that it will be more beneficial as we go along to, to do these things. And number two, the MDAC team will also be sharing a link after this, I believe, to gather uh, a feedback that is used to be submitted to uh, various units in the government to, to look at the stimulus package. So again, please remember to fill up that form, uh, which the MDAC team will share with you guys. So uh, a nice way to kind of wrap up today's session is, is to think about how we as an industry can, can do more to actually help Malaysians and SMEs. So uh, maybe I can get the panelists to each kind of share about what they think they can do with help to help with this situation and what they think others uh, within the industry can do. Because I, I, I see that there's a lot of people from various verticals in, in, in the audience right now. So feel free to share, feel free to shoot some ideas. Um, even the audience, if you guys have any ideas, feel free to shoot it in the chat so that we can look, everyone else can, can look, at it, look at it as well. So maybe we'll start with YT and then coming and then Dato and then uh, YK. So the question is what, um, what can FinTech do to help? Yeah. 
what, what can fin sorry <laughs> i didn't realize i was still muted um what can can fintechs like yours do and what can the other verticals do as well to to help with uh, the situation um good question i think uh yeah, the, among the panelists you know the one i'll go to right now is is uh is uh, uh money societies right um i think you know access to capital uh for for businesses and also for individuals who, who need it right you know, access to cash uh, is going to be one of the the most important things uh, when we come out of it you um, obviously going to be it's going to be super tough right whether you're a bank or, or fintech p2p uh, to do credit evaluation uh, i think uh, coming has shared you know how how they're adjusting to the new to, to the new world um but uh, you know we it's, to me that's that's probably one of the most valuable things anyone could do uh, when it comes to financial services right just make sure that um that companies that that, can, that, uh, that need capital um and that can actually put that capital to use can still get it because right? otherwise if if if, um, if banks or lenders over tighten too much um in response to the environment then it's a lose lose um so I'd, uh, that's the me. right cool thanks uh yt come in do, do you want to go yeah, um, so I think this is a situation whereby, um, this is a situation whereby, sorry, guys were calling me for the next meeting already. Uh, so try to multitask it. Um, but um, I think this is a situation whereby you're sort of caught in a situation of a catch 22, right? At some at one point, uh, as what well, Dato was mentioning, this is a time whereby we really need to go out there to build awareness and educate um, SMEs and businesses um, the importance of digitizing. Um, and also in terms of where does the whole fintech um, industry right across the different verticals fit into their life um, in this in this new state of the world? I think, uh, but at the same time as well, I think for for startups like us, uh, uh, as I was saying, we are trying to be a bit more defensive and a bit more conservative even when it comes to spending, right? Um, so I think to the extent that things that the fintechs could do together, um, so that every marketing dollar goes uh, further down. The line, the more impactful and whatnot. I think that's something that we probably, as a as a group of folks, can can come up with. I think that's one. I think the other one is probably uh, definitely helpful if, um, given the whole importance of digitization and how the fintech piece fits into this um, in this new world, I think it would be helpful if um, industries and agencies can actually support that as well, uh, more from the education awareness and sort of uh, digitization perspective. I think those are two things that I can probably sort of think uh, off the top of my head. Um, in addition to what I was just sharing in terms of um, working with SMEs, working in business. Thank you, Kamen. Uh, if you need to run for your meeting, we don't want to hold you back. Uh, really, thank you again for joining us. Really appreciate uh, you sharing your insights with us. Uh, so let's go to Datuk Wanping, if you have anything to add to that question. Yeah, I'd just like to say that as a government agency that is uh, championing digital economy. Uh, at this moment, our role is very much focusing on how we can encourage, promote, and also facilitate the use of digital technology for people to continue to earn income, for people to, for the business to be able to continue. And um, I still like to stress that not asking people to take back, but it's actually more about use this opportunity if you can afford it, train, upskill your people in this uh, digital area and use this opportunity to look at how to transform your business for the future. Because it's in a, at the short term, you, you have something to do. In the longer run, you'll ensure that your, your business is more sustainable than others. And I, I do agree that when we do digitalization, the fintech community can play a very important role because we are moving into digital and fintech is more about using the digital to drive service, uh, service delivery to start to support the, the general public. So keep coming up with ideas. And that is also playing the role of uh, coming up with uh, new ideas and we are also getting input from everyone else so that together we can come up with solutions that can benefit people. We need to make sure that the economic activity in this country, in Malaysia, at least, is, uh, can, can continue. Because when you have economic activities, that means people continue to have
jobs, people can continue to earn income, the country will continue to have GDP contribution. This is, this is really key. It's not about sitting down, waiting for handout. Handout will dry out one day. We all, every one of us has to contribute and contribute to the economy activities. And I think it can be done if we put our thought together and not to be distracted because, oh, now I need help, so I sit down and wait. It cannot be like that. Thank you. Thank you, Datuk. Waiken, would you like to add anything? Yeah, so um, I think it's um, the, the US president once said, right, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, right? So instead of trying to be opportunistic and ask for, for seed money so you can grow your business, launch your business, I think that's very uh, indulgent. I think the, the, the policy recommendations should come under the category of protecting people's jobs um, and, and public safety. Everything else, you know, just look to yourself for, for resourcefulness, right? In, during the plague, I was reading uh, that Isaac Newton actually came up with this law for, for gravity, general, uh, sorry, for, for gravity in, in the time of the plague. So I think a lot of geniuses in Malaysia, they can go away, do their best work now that they're working from home, no distractions. And, 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 and to come out stronger at the other end. In terms of what um, we assess we are trying to do, um, obviously we, we're still operational, so the, the time to invest is really um, available to you. I, I will say that it is a very volatile time, a very uncertain time, but you can still look to your own personal portfolio now that you have a little bit more time. If you haven't invested, now is a good time to learn, and you can only learn if you have skin in the game. And a uh, multi-generational or once in, once in a decade crisis is a terrible thing to waste in terms of a learning opportunity. And for the people who have already invested, if you, if, if you made certain mistakes, learn from it. And for those who have been, have been doing the right thing all along, you know, just keep, keep doing the right thing. Don't panic and, and ultimately position yourself for, for when you go through a recovery. Thank you, Waiken. Um, I think in closing, I just kind of want to emphasize, um, especially for those who are currently going through their first financial crisis, uh, things look bleak, things look scary, but it's there's always a light at the end of a tunnel. Again, you know, just to circle back to my earlier point is that there are some of the most valuable fintechs were, were founded during the last global financial crisis. So again, you know, be very strategic. If you need to enter into a defensive position, and to enter into a defensive position, but uh, you know, just hang in there and, and 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 continue to look at how to strategize your business and and kind of balance that with how you can also give back to Malaysians and other SMEs as well. With that, um, it only leaves me to thank all the guests for joining us today. Uh, if you can all virtually give them a round of applause, I don't know how that works in webinars uh, to thank them. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we will all end the session. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care now. Bye. Thank you.